So let's put it out there right away. Duke Blue Devils fans on the football side, you lost. It's a loss, and you can't sugarcoat it. There's no sugarcoating. No more victories. You let this one go. You lost this game. You had this game won, and you lost it. It's not even about the block field goal. It's not even about the failed two-point conversion. Manny Diaz will tell you this right away. He will say it right away. They forced six turnovers. Six. The Duke Blue Devils defense. Six turnovers. Kevin Jennings was a shell of himself. There is something about playing in Durham that shakes other teams. Don't quite know what it is yet. Maybe it is the party deck. (laughs) There's something. Something happens when other teams roll in here that makes it tough to start. Maybe it's all the giant IQs in the stands. Maybe that's what it is. I, I think it just simply comes down to this Duke defense led by Ozzy Nichols, who until you see him, or Nicholas, I should say, until you see him play in person, you realize how much of a dog he is and how much he will ruin your day if you're the opposing team starting quarterback playing against Duke. This Duke's defense is a physical team. They're legit. But I want to go right back to the opening statement just mere moments ago. Duke lost this football game. Six turnovers, nothing to capitalize on them. Wasted Malik Murphy's game. Couldn't quite figure out how to close the deals. And that's this is going to haunt them all season, depending on how the rest of the season goes. Again, we just talked about thirds, right? Winning in thirds and how each third of the season. And Duke has one more third to go. 4-0, 2-2, and now the tough stretch here, which would have started with SMU, and this is where I said signature game, signature win. This would have been that for this team. Duke lost the football game. There's no sugarcoating. Graham's right. There's no moral victory here. You owned SMU. You owned them. Like, you were a much more physical team. You were a much more in-your-face team. Yeah, they had some. They had, they had it going early. SMU had it going early in that, in that first half. But you never lost control of that football game. You just didn't seize the moments. And that's what championship teams are built on, are seizing those moments. Mandy Diaz talked about the little things that still need improvement. You know, as we mentioned, points off turnovers, you know, certainly red zone performance um, might, might have been the difference. There was a lot of things we did improve on. You know, our third down offense was, was much better today. We ran the ball better in the second half than we did in the first. Our passing game, I think, took a big step forward today. So there, there are some things that we can improve on, uh, but there are some things that I think did get better um, through the course of the day. SMU's got a really, really good football team. That was two really good football teams. Whatever anybody thinks, there's a reason why those two teams were 6-1. Were and one, um, and, you know, Rhett's, Rhett's does a great job, and they got, a, they got a heck of a team. But I'm going to tell you, we got a heck of a team, too. He's right. He's right. They have a heck of a team. But in the back of his head, he's like, damn it. How could we have not closed that one out? Like, again, missed field goals aside, fine, whatever. Or block field goals, that was an athletic play. The two-point conversion at the end, Murphy had a couple of options that just didn't quite go his way. You know, I, I walked right out of the— um... And you were there, Graham. You were there. After Manny Diaz's post game press conference, I walked out just a few seconds afterwards. Uh, it was late, so I, you know, I wanted to get home. But as I walked out, I saw him talking with uh, athletic director Nina Keen and uh, another visitor, probably close to the program. And I just remember the 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 colleague of Nina Keen, Duke athletic director, saying to Manny Diaz, "Try not to lose too much sleep over this one." And Coach Diaz says, "I never," or responded with, "I never do." But you know, in the back of his head, he's thinking. Gosh, this is one we really needed, especially with our next two games coming up. We could have really – we you want to go 3-0, and so you really could have afforded to have this one. This was a Blue Devils loss. It was a loss. It wasn't a bad loss. It wasn't a terrible loss. You might call it a learning loss more than anything else. But when you can't do those little things, right, the little teeny things, and definitely six turnovers – like, you had this team in your grasp. So There's no doubt about it. W- when you say it's a learn loss, Paul, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Because sure. the takeaway that I have from this is, for Duke on offense, the Malik Murphy in the offense, not saying that they didn't, but 
six uh, six turnovers. You don't capitalize on any of those. You got to learn from that. Absolutely. You Absolutely. Gotta, the offense has to learn to reward the defense for their efforts. And <laughs> that's that's yeah. one of the reasons why. And this is the next question I want to ask you. That's one of the reasons why I felt like Manny Diaz elected to go ahead and go for two in overtime. Yeah, to punish them, there was. You could argue that there was a lot of momentum, but maybe he felt that you know what, if I can just get this one and get out of here because you're at home, right? You, you're not trying to you're not trying to control any elements. Like you you have the the quietest crowd. They're going to be calm for you. You have the you have the play. Like they had the play. SMU was just there a step sooner and a, than you were able to convert. And again, defense, you've done your part. Offense, it's your turn to go out there and do something for the defense. What better way to do it than to go out there and win this football game right now? It's a very smart uh, observation, Graham. You said reward the defense. A diva, the worst thing you want is your defense to go back out there and go, damn it, we got to go make another stop. See damn if they it, can get this one. Again. Yeah. See if they can get this one. See if we they can get this one. Got to force another fumble. Someone has to have that responsibility and that move forward. And it just didn't quite work out. And that's where I say one of those things where it's a loss. There's not a lot of silver lining in this. You'll learn from it, and championship teams convert on things like that at the end of games and capitalize during games. And SMU right now, and every conference has one, right? Since realignment, every conference has that team that took the step up and is moving forward with that conference this season in this whole magical realignment. There's there's one in every conference right now. Oregon clearly in the Big Ten. In the Big 12, it looks like it's Colorado or BYU. BYU is killing it right now. And the ACC? It's SMU. Now, yes, I was just about to say, speaking with, stay on the Mustangs for just a second. During pregame warm-ups, I went down to SMU's side of the field because I just wanted to see what this team looked like up close and personal. Sure. And in the nicest way possible, I can tell you that these are the castaways of players that got overlooked by Texas, Texas A&M, Texas Tech. Like you can tell they just carry themselves with a little bit of an edge, a chip on their shoulder, as some like to say. But they're big, they're athletic, they're strong. And the ACC might have found its new uh, powerhouse program for the upcoming years. They're, uh, they were real last year. There's no doubt about it. You saw it up close in the AAC. They swap out the A for another C, and now they're here. Do you want to touch a bit on uh, ECU real quick? ECU came back. Uh, we talk about uh, defense, uh, <laughs> offense rewarding the defense and went the absolute other way for East Carolina this past weekend. Of course, firing their head coach, Mike Houston, last week, and then rolling through Temple, putting up a 56-burger on the Temple Owls. And you're saying, ah, it's 56 points against Temple. But of those 56 points... Interceptions. Interceptions by the defense. A worthy, worthy performance in terms of rushing for East Carolina. Like, this is the team I think Pirates fans have been waiting for since day one. Since that that really close loss to App State, I think that was like week three, right? Yes. This is the team they've been waiting for, to just explode and put up the points and and take advantage of a new offensive coordinator and all these weapons out there like that never felt like they were going to miss. And Temple played them close, there's no doubt about it. But that third quarter just blew up and it was score after score after score and I'm listening to it and again I was in the car for I was in the car for the third quarter explosion on this one. I had to go back and watch it. And I was listening to um Jim Zoki. Jim Zoki and Jim Zoki to be fair kind of under kind of underplayed how special some of these plays were. I was like, there's another one. It's like all of a sudden, it was within two minutes. They had scored three times, three touchdowns, just back to back to back. And it was like, what is happening here? And that was the offense rewarding the defense and vice versa for that team. And it was it, it was the team that I think Pirates fans were thought this was going to be the team throughout the entire season. Unfortunately, it took a coaching change to get there. And you hope for East Carolina, much like we just talked about North Carolina in our last segment, that they can get things going here as they finish their season and turn a 4-4 four and four record, just like the Heels, into something more. You know, I, I was really appreciative of interim head coach Blake Carroll following the game in the post-game uh, radio press conference that he did, which, you could, by the way, you can listen to all Pirate football games right here on the fan uh, if you're... 
just an ECU fan up here in the Triangle. But he was very honest as far as I'm very emotional right now just because with everything that this program has been through this week, you know, the kids could have easily walked away. We had to kind of make them buy back in. But I feel like, he said, I feel like the coaching staff was under a lot more pressure than the players were. The players every day at practice this week just were loose, calm, and it showed. I mean, this Pirates team looked re-energized and confident after what was probably a uh, – you know, a, an emotional week for the players. Kattenhauser had five touchdown passes. Like again, the team that you thought this was going to be when it for, when the season first opened up, when Rajai Harris is just running like crazy. Like you're putting points up on the board, you're putting some excitement in the stadium, you're getting people to believe again, and you think to yourself, okay, unfortunately it took a coaching change, but maybe this is the team that we've been waiting for, and the team that could make a few more, make a few extra waves. They're not going to win the AAC. Let's, let's, let's call it what it is. That's not going to happen. you got Army and Navy ahead of you, and, and Army took care of, your, <laughs> took care of you uh, a couple of weeks ago. But your schedule's fairly favorable. But you have to go out and execute. And you kind of wish that UAB was still on your schedule, too, because they're yeah. just awful. Oh, my God. I don't know what Trent Dilfer's doing down there. But. but, I mean, you get another bye week, and your next game, even though it's against Florida Atlantic, a team that you could beat, it's your first time playing on primetime television, 8 o'clock kickoff on ESPN. And you know the big storyline is going to be the firing of Mike Houston, how the team responded. So ECU has a chance to really prove that they can get this thing. They can right the ship, no pun intended, on national television in their next game. All right, Pirates fans, we just walked the plank for you there. Pun intended. Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 99.9 The Fan. It's a hockey night in Carolina as the Hurricanes close out, close out their season-long six-game road trip tonight as they take on the Vancouver Canucks at Roger Arena. You can listen to play-by-play -play coverage on your official station for Kaniac Nation 99.9 The Fan. But Stormwatch hosted by Adam Gold beginning at 9.30 and puck drop shortly after 10.00. After the game, tune into the aftermath for official post-game analysis and audio from the Hurricanes locker room. Be sure to also check out the Canes Corner podcast hosted by Adam Gold, live on the fans' YouTube channel and wherever you find your favorite podcast. Week 8 of the NFL concludes with Monday Night Football between the New York Giants and the Pittsburgh Steelers. You can listen to play-by-play -play coverage on 99.9 FM HD2 or 620 AM Buzz Sports Radio with pregame coverage beginning at 7.30. Find these stories and more on WRLSportsFan.com. Paul I. Andrew here. That's Graham Hill. Thanks for hanging out with us. Next up here on 99.9 The Fan. Hopefully we can move your sports day forward. Get you ready for tonight's late night once again. Ugh, bleary eyed Carolina Hurricanes taking on the Vancouver Canucks as they finish off this road trip. It's been very successful for the Carolina Hurricanes over the weekend. I stayed up, so you didn't have to. I didn't even have to worry about catching the highlights because they all happened right in front of me as I was flipping between all the college football that was left. I joined this one after Jack Drury's goal. Jackson Blake, by the way, boy, do the Canes have something special in him. I know. He makes passes and, and sees the ice very clearly. Like, he, he does not need the LASIK, and he definitely does not need glasses. He does things right. He and Jack hooked up on that second goal in that second period against Seattle. And that third period where uh, Seth Jarvis managed to go spin a Rooney again, quick, uh, quick uh, backhander to help the Hurricanes put that one away. It's been a hell of a road trip for the Canes. Like, there's no doubt about it. Rod Brindamore incredibly happy about winning all these early road games. Well, I don't know. I mean, you take the two points anytime you can get them because they count the same, you know, in four months from now. Uh, you know, you're not going to look back at this and go remember it, but it, it's they're big. So, uh, but early in the year, you know, everyone's still got a lot of energy and kind of, you know, going on a long road trip is probably the time you want to do it. Certainly later in the year, you, it gets to drag on. That's when it really, those are tough. So we got one more game here, though, to focus on. I love Rod Brennamore. <laughs> Clearly, he was doing that interview while he was cooking up some food for the team afterwards. For the for the sole purpose of Rod, you get your team just won four of their last five on the road during the the toughest part of your schedule. That's a pretty good win, right? Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's the thing. Rod Brennamore knows that he has a really good hockey team or a hockey club. Rod Brennamore knows that these road games are going to pay off later on in the season. 
Rod knows that he has contribution and a score on every single line. But Isn't I feel like the more you keep this team under the radar and keep wanting them to overachieve, that's just going to set them up perfectly when they get back home and they get to play back in front of their, their home crowd and they start playing these these bigger clubs right now that you see leading divisions. It's the NHL's dirty little secret right now. The Carolina Hurricanes playing good hockey to start the season. And it's not this major anomaly out there. And there are other good teams, don't get me wrong, that are playing hockey this well. But for the amount of turnover that the Carolina Hurricanes had and the fact that they are getting goal scoring from the guys that you were always questioning, like, where's this goal scoring come from? It's coming from the power play. You're seeing contributions from Marty Natchez. And Seth Jarvis is living up to the contract. And then all the other things that get done on the ice that don't get noticed, the Jordan Stahl hits in the board, the Jacob Slavin puck clearing, the the Chatfield and Eric Robinson using you know their God-given speedy talents to go chase pucks down and, and to get around guys. Like that's just all coming together, and boy, Pyotr Kachekov and Freddie Anderson, if they just keep rotating back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and keep turning in these kinds of per- defensive performances, where you know they are having to make some saves, there's no doubt about it. Like it's not everything in front of them is is uh, is being is being uh, taken care of. They're having to do some of that dirty work too. But right now, it's working. It's working for this team, and for this team to come together on the road, and again, we don't know what's going to happen tonight at Vancouver. Vancouver. The Canucks are a much different hockey team. They're playing good hockey, too, at the same kind of bit. It's it's a successful road trip. It's a completely successful road trip for this team, and being able to come home and take on Boston on Halloween night and then start a, start a little home series here uh, in front of the uh, Club Lenovo. Like, there's nothing... There's... Everything about this team and the questions that were raised about this team as they now roll into November, I think they all have been erased. I'm struggling to find a place of like true improvement for the Hurricanes. It's not a good thing to say, I guess, if I was talking, staring Rod Brindamore in the face and go, Coach, your team's really playing good. And he'd look back at me and go, you know, Paul, we lost 4-1 to in the first game. And we couldn't win on back-to-backs in St. Louis. So I guess there's that. But I'm like, if that's my biggest nitpick is that they can't win on a back-to-back, and that they lost the home opener? Like, what more do you say about this team? Pretty good problems to have. I tell you what's very beautiful to know right now. Five straight games with a power play goal for the Hurricanes. Special teams is killing it. I don't know how, I don't have the uh, the penalty kill numbers right in front of me. Adam Gold could tell you off the top of his head as he just walks by. Um, <laughs> he could. Maybe I could call him in. But uh, right now the special teams is looking like the, the, the red-hot spark for this team right now. Canes look good. They've unfortunately had to do it. It's, it's funny uh, during the the radio call, and again, maybe this is just kind of a sign of the times. All right, it's time for Canes after dark, and of course, it's starting you know at ten o'clock here at night. But I'm like, even in Seattle, it's still seven o'clock. I mean, it's dark there too. So I mean, isn't it always just going to be Canes after dark for a while here? Yeah, <laughs> like it's just going to be that way for the next uh, couple of months as, as we get rolling. But Canes are playing good hockey. And I know it's been tough to catch them. I know it's been uh, tough to listen to because, you know, really late night. There's no doubt about it. But Adam Gold can catch you up. He's got Kane's Corner Podcasts after every game. That dude stays up so you don't have to. And he'll give you all the wrap-up, give you all the nitty-gritty about what went right, what didn't go so right. But so far for the Carolina Hurricanes, it's been quite the road trip, and everything's really been going right for this team, and hopefully they can continue that tonight and then uh, bring it home on Halloween night, which is a scheduling quirk I'm not crazy about, but... Hey, listen, if it gets you a chance to dress up in something that's not a Carolina Hurricanes uniform or we get to see Stormy in a Dracula cape again, I suppose that's entertaining too.